In late June and early July 1787, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention were bitterly divided. Several delegations threatened to abandon the convention altogether and go home. Others, perhaps half-heartedly, said they'd find some foreign ally of more honor and good faith who will take them by the hand and do them justice. At the 11th hour, the elder Connecticut statesman Roger Sherman broke the deadlock by introducing the Connecticut Compromise. This compromise, though pleasing to none, was acceptable to all. The Sherman Compromise created the bicameral legislature that we know today, giving each state two seats in the Senate and seats proportionate to their population in the House of Representatives. It was only fitting that Sherman brought the men together. He was respected by men divided along ideological lines. Thomas Jefferson, the leader of the Democratic Republicans, when introducing Sherman to a friend, described him as a man who never said a foolish thing in his life. Federalist John Adams held Sherman in equally high praise, writing that he was one of the most sensible men in the world. He had the clearest head and steadiest heart. But who was Sherman? the only man who signed the Articles of Association, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the U.S. Constitution. And why has history forgotten him? That's what we will try and uncover today as we dive into the story of this forgotten founder. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Roger Sherman was born to devout Puritans William and Mahatabel Sherman on April 19, 1721, in Newton, Massachusetts. The equally pious Roger was not born into a life of wealth and luxury like many of his contemporary statesmen. His father was an impoverished farmer and shoemaker. Owing to his humble origins, Sherman never went to college, though he did have access to his father's somewhat extensive library. He was also educated by the parish's Harvard-educated minister, Reverend Samuel Dunbar, who took an interest in the gifted young boy. Nonetheless, Roger Sherman spent most of his formative years training under his father as a shoemaker, preparing to continue the family business. When William died in 1741, the Sherman family quickly moved to New Milford, Connecticut, where Roger opened the town's first store alongside his brother. While in New Milford, he married his first wife, Elizabeth Hartwell, on November 17, 1741. The couple would go on to have seven children. By 1750, the store founded by the Sherman brothers had become incredibly successful, and Roger took advantage of this success by publishing an almanac which covered a broad range of topics from religion to finance and weather to astronomy. His almanac quickly gained popularity among the townspeople, and Roger soon became one of the most prominent citizens in the area. Throughout this time, he continued reading and expanding his horizons, becoming exceptionally gifted at mathematics. When he traveled to a nearby town on unrelated business, Roger agreed to present some documents to a lawyer for a neighbor. This lawyer was greatly impressed by Roger's quick mind. At the unnamed lawyer's encouragement, he decided to study law. He did this without a college education or a formal apprenticeship and was accepted to the bar in 1754. While he continued running and expanding his store, he also began a legal practice. A year later, he was elected to the Connecticut State Assembly, serving several non-consecutive terms between 1755 and 1766. From 1755 until he died in 1793, Roger Sherman would always hold public office. He also served as Justice of the Peace for Litchfield County from 1755 to 1761. After the death of Elizabeth in 1760, Roger moved to New Haven, the then co-capital of Connecticut. In New Haven, Roger decided to open a store next to Yale College that catered to the needs of its students, providing everything from furniture to books. 
He also found time to remarry, and on May 12, 1763, he wed Rebecca Prescott, who was 21 years his junior. They would remain married until Roger's death and had eight children together. Of Roger's 15 children, 13 survived to adulthood. He also continued to climb the political ladder, being elected to several state positions. He was a member of the state senate from 1766 to 1785, justice of the peace for New Haven for a year in 1765, and a judge on the Connecticut Superior Court from 1766 until 1789. He was Yale's treasurer from 1765 to 1776 and a visiting professor of theology. In light of his services, Yale granted Sherman an honorary Master of Arts degree. It shouldn't be surprising, then, that the taciturn, self-made politician was chosen as one of Connecticut's delegates to the First Continental Congress in 1774. As Roger Sherman made his introduction on the national stage, now would be a good time to pause our story for a moment and try to understand what drove his political philosophy. Before diving into the beliefs of the old Puritan, a disclaimer here, theology is not our forte, though we will try our best to present the political religious philosophy of Connecticut's elite during the 17th and 18th centuries, please know this topic is incredibly complex. We'll effectively try to distill centuries of religious, theological, and political thought and practice into about a page. To better understand this dense topic, you can look at Mark D. Hall's Roger Sherman and the Creation of the American Republic, especially chapters 2 and 3. With that said, back to Sherman. For the pious Sherman, politics and faith had no separation. Active in the Reformed Church throughout his life, Sherman believed that all humans remained in a state of depravity, guilt, misery, exposed to the external curse of the law, dead in trespass and sins, by nature prone to evil and adverse to good, and unable to deliver ourselves to God. The goal of any Christian state, then, should be to facilitate their people's faith in Jesus. The government should be large enough to deliver its depraved and naturally evil citizens to salvation, yet no larger, lest it trample on their rights, liberties, and freedoms. Though Sherman believed in just government, that did not mean government by the people. It meant government for the people. In the words of one historian, it was governance by a select group of men, re-elected year in and year out by reason of their piety, family, wealth, talents, education, and political experience. It should be of little surprise that Sherman seriously doubted the ability of the commoner to participate in the political process, since they were, by nature, prone to evil and adverse to God. At the Constitutional Convention, he said that the average citizen should have as little to do as may be about the government. Taking all this into account, then, we can see his concerns about British intervention in colonial affairs were significantly different from many other founders. While many feared British taxation and intervention in their economic and political affairs, Sherman instead seized on a particular line in the Stamp Act that mentioned Parliament had the right to exercise ecclesiastical jurisdiction within the said colonies. To Sherman, so concerned with saving his people from a state of depravity, the thought of a British bishop controlling the religious affairs of his people was inconceivable. After all, if the Anglican bishop could exercise ecclesiastical jurisdiction within the said colonies, how could Sherman and his fellow leaders guide their fellow citizens to eternal salvation? This was not a question of economic or political consequence. It was a question of eternal life or eternal damnation. It was with this worldview that the old Puritan arrived in Philadelphia in 1774. Sherman did not play a prominent part in the First Continental Congress. Nonetheless, he developed a reputation as an intellectually gifted man committed to the defense of American liberties. 
He also developed a reputation as a poor orator. Of the old Puritan's speaking abilities, John Adams wrote that he is the reverse of grace. There cannot be a more striking contrast to beautiful action than the motion of his hands. He has a clear head and sound judgment, but when he moves a hand in anything like action, it could not have been more opposite to grace. These mannerisms are indicative of the fact that although he was intellectually gifted, his lack of a formal education did diminish somewhat his reputation. At the end of the Congress, Sherman signed the Continental Association. However, he had serious misgivings about the document, especially since the paper conceded that Parliament could regulate the colonies. Regulations, Sherman feared, would apply also to ecclesiastical business. However, when the Second Continental Congress gathered a year later, Sherman was determined to play a much more significant, if cloaked, role. His first noteworthy appointment was to the Committee of Five, chosen to draft the Declaration of Independence. This committee comprised of Jefferson, Franklin, Adams, Robert Livingston, and Sherman. Unfortunately, we know little of Sherman's contribution to the Declaration, and his contributions were likely limited for several reasons. Of the five-man committee, only Sherman served on the Committee of Five, the Committee to Draft the Articles of Confederation, and the Board of War and Ordinance. His workload was so intense that he woke at 7 a.m. and slept at 10 p.m., and most of his efforts were directed to the affairs of the Board of War and Ordinance. He had very little time to spend on the Committee of Five. Furthermore, Sherman could not compete with Jefferson as a writer, orator, or intellectual. Both he and Jefferson knew this. Though we will never know his exact contributions to the draft given to Congress, Sherman gladly signed the document that did proclaim all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson's declaration was craftily worded to sway both supporters of the Enlightenment, who could view the creator as nature, and reformists, who would equate the creator with God, like Sherman. For the Articles of Confederation were again left in the dark as to Sherman's exact role. As the most contentious debates arose surrounding the power of the national government, it's likely that Sherman, a lifelong supporter of states' rights, advocated for a limited federal government role that was limited to offering defense against foreign danger, against internal disputes, making treaties with foreign nations, and regulating foreign commerce to draw revenue from it. Sherman would ultimately sign the Articles before leaving Congress in late 1781. After returning to New Haven, Sherman dedicated himself to his home state, completely revising all statutes with names starting from A to L in two years. That done, he was duly elected as the first mayor of New Haven in 1784, a position he would hold until his death. However, the defining moment of his legacy would come at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. When Sherman returned to Philadelphia in 1787, he had no desire to replace the Articles of Confederation. He was surprised when James Madison introduced the Virginia Plan, a reorganization that would significantly increase the federal government's power. The Virginia Plan's centralization went against everything Sherman stood for. As he succinctly wrote in 1784, while defending the Articles of Confederation, the fewer the laws, the more simple the form of government, the better. If Sherman was caught off guard by Madison's proposal, he was utterly astonished that he cast the sole dissenting vote when those gathered agreed to give Madison's proposed national government the authority to make decisions to which the states are not competent. With his entire conception of government under threat, it is no wonder that Sherman delivered the fourth most speeches at the Constitutional Convention, a total of 131. While not a legendary orator or overly intellectual, he nonetheless skillfully used rhetoric 
timing, and compromise to manipulate the design agenda and alternatives. He staked out positions diametrically opposed to Madison, then expressed a readiness to compromise on a middle ground. His penchant for negotiation may very well have saved the Constitutional Convention. The most contentious issue was the nature of seat allocation in the upper and lower houses of the bicameral legislature proposed in the Virginia Plan. In the Virginia Plan, representation in both houses would be allocated proportionally to population. This plan was, unsurprisingly, supported by the most populous states. The least populated states, however, were horrified that they would have no say in a national government. As a result, they introduced the New Jersey Plan, which proposed instead a unicameral legislature with equal representation. This was soundly rejected, of course, by the larger states. After two weeks of rancorous debate on July 2nd, 1787, the delegations voted 5-5-1 to approve the Virginia Plan, with the larger states voting in favor and the smaller states voting against it. Despite his desire for a unicameral legislature, Sherman had no illusions that a compromise was needed, lest the whole convention collapse. It was with such logic that compelled him on June 11th to introduce a motion that the proportion of suffrage in the first branch should be according to the respective numbers of free inhabitants, and that in the second branch, or Senate, each state should have one vote, but no more. Though the motion would be defeated by a single vote that day, it paved the way for the Connecticut Compromise that would be presented to the convention on July 16th by the Grand Committee. The motion, which also introduced the notion that senators would be appointed directly by their state's legislature and serve six-year terms, would pass by a single vote. This isn't to say Sherman was successful on every account or remained true to his principles. He failed to get the states to reject Madison and James Wilson's call for a strong national executive. He could not convince the delegates that the state legislature should elect their house reps. Sherman, a firm opponent of slavery on religious grounds, courted an alliance with the southern slave states and voted for the three-fifths compromise out of necessity. Sherman also vehemently opposed adopting a Bill of Rights into the Constitution. After all, from his perspective, all it would do is allow the national government to meddle more in state affairs. Protections of rights and liberties were not enshrined in law, Sherman argued, but rather guarded by pious and righteous men. The only real security that you can have for all your important rights must be in the nature of your government, he said, if you suffer any man to govern you who is not strongly interested in supporting your privileges, then you will certainly lose them. But when the dust settled, Sherman and his allies took more than they gave. In a 2005 article, Dr. David B. Robertson found that of the 36 main issues on which Madison and Sherman were opposed, Sherman got his way on 19, Madison got his way on 10, and they compromised on seven. In the end, both would sign the document their divisions created. Although he wasn't thrilled about the new constitution, it seems no one was thrilled either. Sherman had privately decided that if it was the best option available, then they would ensure the federal government could function, preserve national unity, and could, to the best conceivable ability, protect state and local rights. He wrote several articles for the New Haven Gazette in late 1787 advocating for Connecticut to ratify the document, which the state did on January 9, 1788, by a vote of 128 to 40. On March 4, 1789, Sherman was elected as the first representative of Connecticut's at-large district, showing the blurry lines that have always existed between church and state in the U.S., President George Washington issued his 1789 Thanksgiving Day proclamation at Sherman's insistence. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor, I do recommend and assign 
Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being, who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be. He was elected to the United States Senate on a special election held on June 13th, 1791, assuming office the very same day. While serving as senator, he would vote against appointing the irreligious Governor Morris as U.S. Minister to France. He would continue to serve as a mayor of New Haven and U.S. Senator from Connecticut until his death from typhoid fever on July 23, 1793, at the age of 72. He was laid to rest at Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven. Given the enormity of his influence on our government, why do we not remember Roger Sherman? There are several potential reasons. One possible reason is that he was old. Of all the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, only 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin was older than Sherman because he wouldn't play a prominent role in the new national government dying in 1793, he never really had a chance to claim his place in history as one of America's first statesmen. And his Calvinist beliefs were also at odds with many founders. Even if many early Americans held his views, many of the most famous founders did not. And as the nation drifted away from Puritanism towards Episcopalian and Anglican forms of religion instead, Sherman's outdated worldview was easy to ignore. While his contemporaries did laud him for his intellectual ability and practical common sense, nobody ever respected him as an imaginative intellectual or a gifted speaker. If anything, they looked down on his mannerisms. This was made clear at the Constitutional Convention when a delegate from Georgia wrote, He is awkward, unmeaning, and unaccountably stranger in his manner. But in his train of thinking, there is something regular, deep, and comprehensive. Yet the oddity of his address, the vulgarisms that accompany his public speaking, and that strange New England cant which runs through his public as well as private speaking, makes everything connected with him grotesque and laughable. Yeesh. Despite his shortcomings, however, he did earn their respect. As this Georgian delegate continued, yet he deserves infinite praise. No man has a better heart or a clearer head. If he cannot embellish, he can furnish thoughts that are wise and useful. In the end, it doesn't really matter why Sherman has been forgotten. He should be remembered. Without his ability to furnish these wise and useful thoughts that led to effective compromise, the U.S. Constitution may never have come to pass. And if it didn't, the history of the United States, the form of our current government, may look very different. Perhaps historian Julian P. Boyd characterized Sherman the best. He called him the great compromiser in the formative period of the Republic. For better or for worse, without Roger Sherman, the United States of America would look very different. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Join us next time as we conclude the series by looking at our next forgotten figure, Washington's spy master, Major Benjamin Talmadge.